So in today's lecture, I'm going to um, talk about uh, Bernoulli trials uh, and the binomial, or what's also known as a binomial trial, and how those trials lead to uh, what's called a binomial distribution. Um, and we're going to talk about both the PMF and the uh, CDF for the binomial distribution. Um, we're going to look at a graphical interpretation of the binomial PDF, PMF and CDF. And then um, we're going to look at a special case of the binomial distribution, um, that is the geometric distribution, and from that derive what are called return periods or recurrence intervals, which are uh, very useful in engineering practice. Okay, so let's begin with a discussion of what a Bernoulli trial is. <clears throat> so I just want to make sure I'm, my volume's still on. Yep, that's good. Okay. So um, a Bernoulli trial is basically a random experiment in which there are exactly two possible outcomes, either an occurrence of an event or a non-occurrence of an event. And so the classic case would be when you toss a coin, uh, the coin is going to land either heads or tails. So you can think of heads as the occurrence of an event and then tails being the non-occurrence of uh, the head event. <laughs> okay. Um, the Bernoulli trial also assumes that the probability of the occurrence of an event in each trial is constant. So every time we throw the coin, we're going to have a 50% chance of uh, the coin landing uh, heads or tails, and that doesn't change with uh, uh, the number of trials. And the trials are statistically independent. So if I throw the coin, um, the probability that it's going to land head, uh, heads or tails is not influenced by um, how the uh, the coin landed in previous trials. Okay, so that's what a Bernoulli trial is. Now let's talk about how um, Bernoulli trials lead to the binomial distribution. And um, for this, I want to kind of illustrate the binomial or derive the binomial distribution through an example. So I'm going to go through two examples and kind of illustrate how the binomial distribution comes about from Bernoulli trials. And so the first example involves a company that has six trucks. We're going to denote each of those trucks as A, B, C, D, E, and F. So each truck gets a letter. Um, and at any given time, the trucks, these trucks may be either operational which we designate with an O, or non-operational, which we designate with an N. Based on experience, the owner of the company estimates that there is a 90% chance that a truck will be operational. So any given truck will be operational at any given time. What is the probability that all five trucks will be operational? So, um, so what we're really thinking about here is we're looking for the probability of, of, of an event which consists of the intersection of essentially five events, which are uh, the events where all five trucks are operational. And so what I'm doing here is I'm denoting that by subscripting each of the uh, letters denoting the trucks with an O indicating operational. So all five trucks are operational, and we demand that they all be operational at the same time, and so basically that's going to be an intersection. We need A to be operational, and B to be operational, and C to be operational, and so forth. And so basically we're looking at the probability then of the intersection of all five trucks being operational. Uh, we know that these, <clears throat> uh, if it, this is a Bernoulli trial, uh, we know that uh, the um, outcome, that is whether the trucks are operational or non-operational, is supposed to be statistically independent, so it's not supposed to depend on other trials or other trucks, because the trucks in this case, sort of whether they're operational or non-operational, is essentially a trial, like the throwing of a coin. In that case, um, we know from our product rule that we can write out the probability of the intersection of a series of events as the product of their probabilities. And so <clears throat> that's what I've done here. I basically just re-express the probability of their intersection as a product of their probabilities. And we know that the probability of any given truck being operational is 0.9, and we've got five of the trucks. So that's going to be 0.9 raised to the fifth power, which works out to 59%. So there's a 59% chance that all five trucks will be operational if there is a 90% chance that any given truck will be operational. Okay, so that's the first example. <clears throat> and now we're going to step up our game a little bit and ask the following question. What is the probability that one of the five trucks will be non-operational? <clears throat> and this is a, kind of a trick question because it turns out that um, it isn't just that we are asking for the intersection of, say, one truck that's non-operational. Here I've got 
truck A is not operational, subscripted N, with four other trucks operational. So it's not just that event that we have to worry about. We also have to worry about other combinations of these um, events. So we could have um, an event where the truck A is non-operational, or we could have an event where truck B is non-operational, C is non-operational, D is non-operational, and E is non-operational. All of these are equally valid cases where one truck would be non-operational. And so we need to be able to consider the probability of you know, each of these um, events essentially as an or. So we could have this event, or we could have this event, or we could have this event, and so forth. And of course, that's a union. Uh, so we're looking for the probability of uh, each of these events, the um, one of the trucks non-operational intersected with uh, all the rest of the trucks operational union with the different combinations or permutations uh, of the non-operational truck. <clears throat> and we furthermore know that these events that we've uh, unioned here are mutually exclusive because if you say look at uh, truck B, um, these two events are definitely mutual ex mutually exclusive because it's not possible that uh, truck B could be both operational and non-operational. It's one or the other. And so that's true with all of these events. They're mutually exclusive. And so we can use the addition rule for mutually exclusive events, which basically just allows us to add together um, all those union events, the probability of all those union events. Um, and furthermore, we can get a little bit smarter because um, we know that for each truck, there are really only two outcomes. It's a Bernoulli trial, right? Either the truck is operational or it's not operational, which means that the event that the truck is not operational is equal to um, the complement of the event where it's uh, operational. <laughs> so A sub N is equal to A sub zero complement. And so I went ahead and replaced all of the um, events or the, all the trucks which are non-operational, the B sub N, C sub N, and so forth, with the complement of the operational event. The reason I did that is because if um, the uh, probability of a truck being operational is 0 0.9, its complement is 0 0.1, so I can write that down really easily. And so basically then if I translate this into um, some arithmetic, I've got uh, five different events which all have exactly the same probability. There's, these are just different permutations of the essentially the same probability. Um, so I put a five here representing the five different um, permutations of which truck is non-operational. At times, then I calculate the probability, and what I've got is there's um, a 10% chance uh, that um, one of the trucks will be non-operational, so I have a 0 0.1, times uh, there is uh, a 90% chance that a uh, truck will be operational, raised to the fourth power because there are four trucks which are operational. So one non-operational truck times uh, one operational truck, uh, the probabilities of those, uh, times five for all the different permutations equals 32.8%. So there's a 32.8% probability that one of the five trucks will be non-operational. So I went through this problem because I wanted to uh, kind of motivate the binomial distribution and, and hopefully uh, in this context it'll make some sense. So again, let's just kind of dissect what we did here. We had the, the leading term here, which is the number of permutations of four operational trucks and one non-operational truck. Right, so that's basically what these permutations are here. The four different terms represent all the permutations where we have four operational trucks and one non-operational truck. Um, and one way to represent that mathematically is through the binomial coefficient, which basically tells you for n trials um, and x occurrences within those n trials how many different permutations you can have. So um, so in our case, we had five trials, that is five trucks, four of which were operational. And so if we just plug and chug here, we're going to have five factorial divided by four factorial, um, the number of operational trucks, times uh, five minus four, which is one factorial. One factorial is just one. And then in the numerator, we can rewrite five factorial as five times four factorial, and the four factorials will cancel. So we end up with five, which is exactly the number we got here. So there's five permutations of um, X occurrences in N trials. Um, this second term, the 0 0.1, is of course the probability of a single truck being non-operational, which is going to be the complement of the probability that they're operational. So I've just indicated little p here being the probability that they, the truck is operational, its complement 
is going to be 0 0.1. And then um, we have the probability of four trucks being operational, which is going to be the probability of one of those trucks being operational, 0 0.9, raised to the fourth power. And so, um, so basically, that's, um, that's kind of uh, all of the elements of what we calculated here. If we put it all together, we get um, what's known as the binomial distribution. This is a probability mass function. Um, why? It's because we're talking about a random variable x, which is a discrete random variable. That is, it can take on um, a, a sort of discrete number of events. It could be one um, occurrence, two occurrence, three occurrence, four occurrence, or five occurrence, up to n occurrences in general, right? So uh, we're talking about the probability then of the random, that discrete random variable x equal to a, a specific number of occurrences, little x, given n trials and a probability p for uh, each occurrence, or the probability that an occurrence will occur on a trial of little p. Uh, and that's going to be, again, the binomial coefficient, which tells us how many permutations we're going to have uh, for x occurrences in n trial, times the probability um, uh, of, a, um, of the event or the occurrence uh, raised to the x, which is the number of, of occurrences, <clears throat> times the probability of a non-occurrence, which is 1 minus p, raised to the number of non-occurrences, which is just simply uh, the total number of trials minus the number of occurrences. And so this is the general PMF, which describes uh, problems like what we just analyzed here. Um, so there it is formally. Again, the binomial distribution PMF, n is the number of trials, x is the random variable for the number of occurrences of some uh, event of interest, Little x is a specific realization of the random variable. P is a probability of occurrence on any given trial. And 1 minus P is a probability of non-occurrence. <laughs> 1 minus P is a probability of non-occurrence um, on any given trial. And so <laughs> um, then the PMF looks like this. And again, the binomial coefficient looks like this. So. Um, Consider the probability of throwing, uh, let me go through an example and just kind of illustrate this um, in case it's not clear yet. Um, but uh, so again, what we're doing is we want to just apply that binomial um, PMF. Consider the probability of throwing one head in five coin tosses. So this is a sort of typical high school problem, right? Um, in this case, we have five trials. We have one occurrence. That is, we've got one head. Uh, that means we've got four tails, but uh, if we define um, throwing ahead is an occurrence, then we have one occurrence and four non-occurrences. And the probability of, of getting ahead on any throw is 50% uh, or 0 0.5. And so plugging into the um, binomial PMF, the probability that the uh, random variable for number of um, heads is equal to one, so that would be the specific realization, given five trials and a probability of 0 0.5. It's going to be equal to the binomial coefficient, where we've got five trials, one event, uh, that is one of those throws is going to be a head, times 0 0.5, which is the probability of throwing a head raised to the first power for one head, and then also times 1 minus 0 0.5, the complement, which is also 0 0.5, um, of throwing uh, tails raised to the fourth. And so if you work it out, Basically, then the binomial coefficient, again, is uh, 5 factorial over 1 factorial times 4 factorial. And uh, times 0.5 times 0.5 raised to the 4. Uh, this thing is just 5 times 4 factorial. 4 factorials cancel, so we're left with 5 times 0.5 times 0.0625, which is 0.5 raised to the 4, which works out to 15.6%. So that is the probability of throwing one head in five coin tosses. Uh, you could have, of course, for this problem, just done a brute force to work out the sequence or all the possible permutations, um, and you would have gotten the same result. There's five different permutations. That's number five. And then uh, we give a uh, 1.5 for the uh, head, um, you know, getting a, an occurrence in each of those um, five trials times 0.5 for um, all the tails raised to the four. And again, that gives us 15.6%. So <clears throat> either way, it works. But of course, with the binomial distribution, now we have a formula we can apply to any problem, including problems which are actually quite complicated and wouldn't um, lend themselves to kind of a simple analysis like this. Uh, we can, since we have a PMF, 
we can also write down the corresponding CDF. And so now we're asking, um, what is the probability that the random variable for the number of occurrences in n trials is less than or equal to some specific number of occurrences given the n trials and the probability p per trial. Um, and of course, that's the CDF for that random variable evaluated at the level x. Um, and, uh, and that's just going to be our PMF now uh, summed from uh, k equal 0 to x. <clears throat> and so what is k in this case? k is the, um, the number of occurrences in n trials. Uh, but we're summing um, you know, the set of, of occurrences from zero occurrences up to uh, x occurrences, which is going to give us that probability that the random variable x is less than or equal to little x. Okay. And note here that k is replacing x um, in the PMF <clears throat> because we're summing k from zero to x. Okay, so what, what does this look like graphically? Um, I, um, I went to uh, Mathematica again because I like Mathematica. You would use probably MATLAB or whatever program you like. And so this is our uh, probability mass function again for the binomial distribution. And, um, and interestingly, I think, ah, here it is. Okay. So um, I had this function <laughs> listed here, but it apparently didn't show up in Mathematica, but I can kind of give you a hint of what it looks like. So basically, I had a function which was exactly the PMF, which is a binomial uh, given in trials, and you know, um, would be x of n's um, times the two probabilities. This is actually the uh, CDF version of it. But anyway, I wrote out um, in Mathematica a, um, let me see if it's hidden there. It might be, just have a quick look, see if it's hiding. Nope, it's not hiding. Um, anyway, so um, I wrote out the uh, function for uh, the binomial distribution, and then which I called fpdf, and um, and then I plotted it using this Mathematica command called discrete plot, which allows us to plot essentially discrete events. And um, I'm evaluating this binomial distribution for uh, n equal to ten, so there's ten trials, and then I'm um, basically looking at what that PMF looks like for different probabilities of an event occurring on each trial. And so I've got three different probabilities. I've got uh, p equal to 0.1 or 10%, p equal to 0.5 or 50%, and p equal to 0.8 or 80%. And so um, this is what it looks like. So for p equal to 0.1, um, if you look at the mode of the distribution, so that's the blue points there, the mode's going to be uh, right at one um, event. So the most likely uh, number of occurrences out of 10 trials is one. And if you think about that, it makes perfect sense because um, one occurrence out of 10 trials is 10%, and the probability that we're going to get an occurrence on any given trial is um, 0.1 in this case. But, you know, not all the probability is concentrated at that uh, one out of 10 uh, trials, right? We've got quite a bit of probability at zero. So there's actually almost a 35% uh, probability that um, we will get uh, zero occurrences out of 10 trials. <clears throat> so that's non-trivial. Just a little bit more likely that we're going to get one occurrence out of 10 trials. And then it falls off really rapidly. So um, the getting two occurrences out of 10 trials drops to 20%, and then it's like 5% for three occurrences and then practically zero for um, five or more occurrences. So definitely a positively skewed uh, distribution for p equal to 0 0.1. Uh, if we raise that p to 0 0.5, so this is like the coin toss, there's a 50% chance uh, of uh, having an occurrence. That uh, mode shifts to, you know, not surprisingly, five, right? So the most likely um, number of occurrences is five out of 10 trials which makes perfect sense because p is 0.5. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the, the probability falls off symmetrically either, either side. And so there's still a lot of probability associated with, say, three, trial, three, occurrences, three occurrences out of 10 trials and also seven occurrences out of 10 trials and so forth. So a lot of probability sort of spread out um, over the number of occurrences. And then if we raise the probability to 0 0.8, 
Again, not surprisingly, the mode comes in at uh, eight occurrences out of 10 trials. Um, but again, there's quite a bit of probability on either side of that, <clears throat> although the distribution in this case is very negatively skewed. Okay, and so this is a corresponding uh, cumulative distribution function. And so now you can actually see the, the function that I used for this. So I just defined a function. Um, remember, the underscore for these variables just indicates that um, they're kind of uh, wild cards. I can put anything there, including um, you know, numbers or other functions or whatever I want. Um, but they're variables within the function. And the colon equals just indicates that this is going to be a function. So I'm summing the binomial coefficient n comma k. So that's what I've got here. I'm summing that. Um, and also times p raised to the k times 1 minus p raised to the n minus k. And I'm summing from k equals 0 to x. Right? So I'm just basically transcribing the, the uh, CDF <coughs> into uh, Mathematica code. And then I'm plotting um, you know, a series of, of uh, CDFs for essentially the same three uh, probabilities uh, of an occurrence on a given trial of 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.8. <coughs> and so basically what you see is this just looks like typical CDFs, right? They start around 0, and they um, sort of saturate at 1 um, at uh, 10 occurrences or 10 trials, right, which is the maximum number of uh, occurrences we could possibly get. And, uh, and not surprisingly, for smaller probabilities, we get saturation more quickly. So if we look at this, say, um, the um, probability that we're going to have two or fewer occurrences in 10 trials comes in at, actually, probably it's right here, it's about 90%. Um, <laughs> so for uh, probability of getting um, an occurrence of 0 0.1 per trial, uh, we essentially are at 90% for a probability of two or fewer um, occurrences in 10 trials. So um, it's a really rapid saturation. Uh, P 0 0.5 is more spread out, and you can see that the um, median or the 50th percentile is right around five um, occurrences, which is exactly what we would expect in 10 trials since P 0 0.5. And likewise, with the um, cumulative distribution for p uh, equal to 0 0.8, then it's sort of moved over to the right. And now if we looked for the 50th percentile or the median, uh, that would come in at about, <coughs> excuse me, eight um, occurrences in 10 trials, which makes perfect sense because um, the probability for an event um, in a given trial in this case is 0 0.8. So if that didn't really make a lot of sense. You should come back and really study this and make sure you understand it because I can guarantee you that, that it'll appear on the exam. Um, it's really important to be able to read CDFs and, and it's kind of a skill that I want to make sure you leave the class um, knowing how to do. Okay, so um, now let's look at a special uh, case of the binomial PMF called a geometric distribution. And so we're going to go um, look at that. So. The geometric distribution is a simplified form of the binomial distribution in which there is only a single sequence, the number of trials into a until a specified event occurs for the first time. Um, so imagine that um, the trial is um, something that occurs every year. Uh, for example, an, maybe an earthquake. So we get a really big earthquake, bigger than, say, magnitude 7 um, in a given year. So most years we don't get such an earthquake, um, but then occasionally we do get such an earthquake. And so we might be very interested in knowing, you know, the number of years it'll take before we get that next uh, magnitude 7 earthquake. And so um, for that, we might be using uh, this geometric distribution. And so in this case, we're going to choose a different random variable. Now remember, in the binomial PMF and CDF, the random variable x was the number of occurrences given n trials and a probability p. Here we're going to define a new random variable, which is the number of trials that we need in order to get to the first event. Okay, So that's a very important difference. Let me explain it again or, or repeat it again. So x for the binomial distribution was the number of occurrences in n trials. Uh, big N, or the random variable n, is the number of trials to the first event. Okay, Because a lot of confusion comes about from the distinction between those two. Um, and basically, we're going to assume that, that the probability of the occurrence of an event 
is um, the same in every trial and it's little p. And the PMF um, sort of corresponding to this distribution, which is called the geometric distribution, is given here. So it says the probability that the number of trials um, is going to be equal to the number of trials to the first event is going to be equal to some specific number of trials, little n, is equal to p times 1 minus p to the n minus 1. What does this mean on the right hand side? Basically, if you think about it, um, say you had five years you were looking at. So basically, it would be um, the, if you were looking at the probability that the random variable was equal to five, then it would be basically a series of events in which there was a non occurrence in say year one, a non-occurrence in year two, a non-occurrence in year three, a non-occurrence in year four, and then an occurrence in year five, right? So there's only one occurrence, so that's why the probability p is raised to the one, right? And there's going to be n minus one, or in this case four, my example, four non-occurrences, which is why the complement of p, or one minus p, is raised to the n minus one. Um, <clears throat> One of the cool things about the geometri geometric distributions is that we can um, we can determine what are known as return periods or recurrence intervals. Um, and uh, what is a recurrence er interval or a return period? Um, basically, imagine that that we're thinking about um, again a set of trials which are essentially time, like uh, every trial is a year, just like we were talking about with the earthquake. Um, and so basically uh, we have some event we're interested in. Again, let's use that big earthquake as an example. Um, and so we want to know how many years we can expect on average um, to wait between big earthquakes. Right. And we understand that it's a random variable, so, so the earthquake could occur sooner um, than our, our expe expected value, or it could occur later than our expected value. Uh, but we want to know what the expected value of that um, sort of wait time, which is also called a return period, um, looks like. Okay, so in that case, uh, we want the expected value of um, the wait time or uh, the return period, which we're denoting here as a random variable, uh, capital T. And, um, and then in this case, the trials are essentially years, right? So uh, uh, the first trial would be year one, second trial would be year two, third trial would be year three, and so forth. And so what we can do is basically weight um, the number of years that we have to wait <laughs> by the corresponding probability that we're going to get um, an occurrence after waiting that long. And so um, what does that sum go, and this is basically a mathematical expectation, so uh, we're just taking the PMF for the geometric distribution, which is the P times one minus P raised to the T minus one, and we're waiting that, um, we're using that probability uh, to wait the, um, the, the time, the number of years that we're um, waiting for the next event. Um, so what does the index T represent? It basically um, represents the, the number of years that we've had to wait. So um, T equals one means that there's been one trial or say one year, and then we would compute the corresponding probability that after um, one trial we would have uh, or on one trial we would have our occurrence. So that would be, what is that going to be? If t is equal to 1, then 1 minus p is raised to the 0 because there are no um, not occurrences in that particular sequence. Um, and then we just have the probability p. So in that case, we're just taking 1 times the probability of an occurrence in that year. <coughs> And then the next term in the sum is going to be t equal to 2. So basically we're saying that's the sequence where we had to, um, we had the first year we didn't have an occurrence, and then the second year we had an occurrence, right? And so, um, so basically that would be uh, t equal to 2 here, and then we would have the probability of that occurrence at the end of the sequence at, at year 2 times 1 minus p raised to the 1 because there would be one non-occurrence. So because for t equal to 2, there's going to be a non-occurrence and then an occurrence. So there's one of each. And then if t is equal to 3 in the sum, so we just keep doing this, right, then we've got three years weighted by the probability of an occurrence in the third year, p, times the probability of a non-occurrence, 1 minus p raised to uh, the 2, because uh, we've got two years of non-occurrence followed by an occurrence. And we keep doing that 
for uh, basically all possible times up to infinity, and we get the expected value for the uh, time we would have to wait um, for an occurrence, which is also, you could think of it as the mean time we have to wait for an occurrence. Um, so you can think about it as, you know, basically you start, start the clock and then there's a series of years and you have an occurrence. We've got the mean time to that, you know, that occurrence um, from this equation. The other way to think about it is that after it has occurred, then this is the amount of time we'd have to wait on average for the next occurrence and um, so on. Okay. Um, so basically, I've just rewrote the um, definition of the return period from the previous slide. Note I can um, pull the probability out of the sum. We're just going to do a little bit of math and, and come up with a really cool result. And then we're left with this infinite series, right, which looks like one of those infinite series that might converge, you know, that we learned about in, in calculus. I can never remember those things, you know, geometric series and so forth. So I just plugged it into Mathematica. Probably shouldn't admit that. Plugged it into Mathematica, I asked for the sum of essentially uh, what's inside the uh, sum here, t times 1 minus p raised to the t minus 1, for t going from 1 to infinity, and it gave me that the answer is 1 over p squared. So this is a really cool result. Basically, the average uh, recurrence interval or return period for um, an event is going to be 1 over the probability that the event occurs in any given trial. So, um, so, you know, one of the implications is that if, say, we had a 1% chance of a magnitude 7 earthquake this year, then what it's saying is that the um, average wait time between uh, magnitude 7 earthquakes or larger uh, would be um, 100 years. And so you may have heard in the news people talking about like a 100-year flood. What they're really saying is that in any given year, there's a 1% chance that um, that flood of that magnitude would occur. So, um, so this is a really useful relationship between for calculating recurrence intervals based on the probability of occurrence in any given trial. Um, there's a couple other results that, that we can um, squeeze out of uh, the geometric distribution. Um, so, you know, we've got a certain number of years T bar, our expected value for T bar, uh, and that's basically the sort of mean um, number of years we'd have to wait for the, the sort of next occurrence of something. Um, we might be interested in, in assessing the probability that there is not an occurrence in that wait time. And you might be surprised to even think that we'd ask that question, right? Because, because we're saying, oh, well, on average, we have to wait that T bar time, that number of years, right? So there shouldn't be any occurrences in that number of years. But if you think about it, that's not right because this is just the mean time we have to wait to an occurrence. There could very well be an occurrence within that wait time. In fact, there is a really big probability that there's going to be an occurrence in that wait time. And we can figure out what that probability is. So the probability of no occurrence during that return period or wait time is going to be 1 minus p, which is the probability of non-occurrence raised to the number of years that we are computing for t bar. right? Um, and <clears throat> we can also uh, expand this uh, using the binomial theorem, and so it's uh, equal to 1 minus the uh, return period times the probability plus higher order terms, uh, which looks a lot like the uh, e to the minus x. When it's expanded, uh, it gives 1 minus x plus uh, order, uh, higher order terms, and so we can basically rewrite uh, the probability of a non-occurrence in the wait time t in terms of the exponential. Um, and basically what we find is that, that the probability of a non-occurrence in that wait time or that return period t is equal to e to the minus pt, but remember t, t bar here is equal to 1 over p, and so that's really just e to the minus 1, which is 0 0.3679. So um, <laughs> the probability of the uh, occurrence of an event not occurring in the wait time t is only 36.8 percent. So it's not 100 percent, it's actually less than 50 percent um, chance that there will be no occurrence in the wait time. So that makes a distinction between the mean time to an occurrence and the actual probability uh, that there will not be an occurrence in that wait time. This is something that confuses people a lot because they think, oh, say a hundred year storm, that means that there's not going to be another storm like that for 100 years. But this is saying actually that that there's um, you know within that 100 year interval there's a only a 37 percent chance that there won't be a 100 year storm. Um, 
we can also look at the probability that there uh, would be an occurrence during the return period as the complement of the probability of a non-occurrence. So that's going to be 1 minus the 1 minus p raised to the t bar, which is equal to 63.2%. So the chance that we're going to get an occurrence of an event within the, um, the mean wait time or re mean return period is actually 63%, not zero, as you kind of would imagine, maybe before you took the class, you would assume um, with a 100-year uh, return, return interval for some event like a flood. Okay, so uh, that's all I have to share with you today. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in class. Bye.